Good afternoon. Well, Thank you for joining us. Nicole, good afternoon. How are you? Nicole, Nicole are you there? Hi, sorry, I am here. Uh, that's all right. You, you didn't see me coming. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's okay. How are you guys today? We're doing very good. well. Very good. We're happy to have you on another week. So um, we thank you and, and any of the customers we have on the call or any staff. You know, we're glad that you guys are taking time out of your busy day to to kind of talk with us and talk with you guys and listen to what you have to say. And with that, I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you so much, Nicole, and thanks for the invite to speak with some of your customers. You know, we've said each week, you know, things are changing daily, and this is no different. And so we've got some good information today about really the next round of the, uh, of the Paycheck Protection Program. And so without wasting time, uh, Ed, let me, uh, let me give it, hand it over to you. All right. Well, just a quick quick introduction of the three of us here for those of you that uh, that, ha that haven't been on a previous webinar. My name is Ed Earl, and I run a construction project management company in San Diego, uh, working as an owner's rep with homeowners that are building custom homes and doing high-end remodels. And I'm also a business coach with these two gentlemen here, and I have an MBA from Stanford. So I'll turn it over to Paul. Hi. Well, my my. My master's is only from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which uh, you know isn't impressive at Stanford, but it's a good school. Um, and we're here to help. And I was going to ask, since we have a small group here today, um, and we have Derek, I guess Gustafson, did he, did you get funded yet on the loan, or do you are you looking to get funded? Or Dave Miller? Can you, can you, can you answer that question? I don't know how they do. Yeah, that. I can unmute e if either one of you. Uh kind of raise their hand. I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, you could raise your hand or you could put uh, a question mark. Um, in fact, let me just see. Uh, Dave, I'm going to unmute you. Dave, are you there? Dave Miller? Okay. All no right. Response. Yeah, how about Derek? Derek, are you there with us? Either that or they're in listen only mode, but you, yep. you've unmuted right. them. Right. Okay. So, okay. All right. Well, we're so going to cover, I guess, we're going to cover, several we're gonna cover this, phone. right? Go ahead. Right. So I'm just curious because I think for, this is a recorded webinar. And I want people to, you know, get this information quickly because it's a now or never kind of thing once more. So anyhow, interesting time, a lot of opportunity, a lot of issues, but we're here to help. And I guess I should introduce myself. I, yeah, I'm the only one with the real degree, and that's the School of Hard Knocks. So uh, I will keep falling back on that in comparison with both your degrees. I, what is it? Uh, I had to earn mine. You did too, but uh, mine took yeah. 20 years. So it's just it's taken a little bit longer. But so far, so good. And uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Let's, uh, let's review some of these changes and how it's affecting us. All right. So just kind of a quick update to let you know what the purpose of these weekly webinars are. Again, with things changing as quickly as they are just about every day, if definitely every week, we just want to give you a chance to be able to, to hear what the latest and greatest is. We have about 50 residential contractors that we talk to on a weekly basis. So we feel like we really have our pulse on what's happening in all of the various areas of the country. You know, some areas you're still allowed to work, other areas you aren't. So just kind of all of that, all of that type of stuff. Uh, just to give you the quick update on that, the good news is that really not much has changed here in uh, almost two weeks since there's been any changes in the status of, um, of where you can work in the country. So we still have those five red states, which are the states where uh, construction is specifically excluded. And all of the green states are states where there is a statewide order, but um, construction is is not uh, restricted. And then you have those those lone seven states there. Those are the gray states where there is no statewide order. So if you're lucky enough to live in one of those states, you don't have any statewide orders at this point. 
Um, however, there's a downside to living in one of those gray states, and it's this. Um, I uh, saw this recent article that uh, there's a, a new um, researchers are now projecting a new model that's showing that four states can open as early as May 4th. And those are Vermont, West Virginia, Montana, and Hawaii. Um, and then projecting that most of the others can open in mid to late May. However, they've also identified six states that have to wait until late June or even July. And guess what those states are? They're those gray states. Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Utah, and Arkansas, and Oklahoma. So unfortunately, that's the downside of living in one of those states is that uh, they're projecting it's going to take longer for the, the virus to run its course in, in your states. So, all right, let's give you an update on where we are with the CARES Act. Again, if you recall, that was a $2.2 billion um, program, I'm sorry, 2.2 trillion with a T, trillion dollar program um, that was created and passed here um, in, in March. So on the COVID-19 economic injury disaster loan, those advanced payments are actually starting to show up in people's bank accounts. As of last week, we have clients that that money is starting to show up in their bank accounts. The bad news is that they've changed the rules now and they're limiting those advanced payments to $1,000 per employee. So the only way that you can get the full 10,000 that they originally represented you would get is if you have at least 10 employees. Um, there's also a larger um, loan as part of this EIDL program, um, but we have not had any further details as to when those will be determined and how they'll be dispersed. The second and the biggest program really where we've seen the most uh, action is with the Paycheck Protection Program. And there was the first round of funding, which was $349 bill billion. They started with that on April 3rd, and it ran out last week on April 16th in less than two weeks. The good news is that on Tuesday, the Senate passed an additional $320 billion to replenish that program. Um, and as you may have heard, there was an issue with a lot of the um, banks targeting their larger and bigger customers for these loans. And so the, um, wisely, the Senate also included a provision that 20% of the funds uh, of this additional new amount of the 349 is going to be set aside for smaller lenders, smaller lenders that are much more equipped to be able to distribute these funds to a larger number of people. And we're going to talk about that here in a couple of slides coming up. So the Senate passed it on Tuesday. The House is expected to pass it today. I haven't had a chance to hop on. Uh, hey, you know, if you want to watch hours. it on the Internet, you, you can. I was just, well, you can watch them debating it on the Internet right now. It's live. I'm uh, debating the uh, bill as we speak. Okay. Yes. It's a done right. deal. Well, I mean, come on. It's, yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. And I wanted yeah. you to know, Paul, Paul, that Derek did respond. And uh, and you can piggyback this when we get to this. Paul submitted his application to a small because bank I in Arlington. Right. What's Seven? that? Go ahead. After after it, nothing sorry. happened, he closed his application at Bank of America uh, because mm -hmm. they were so slow to re so slow to respond. Um, so we're going to piggyback this, Derek, and give you some options unless you've already taken to, taken advantage of this. So this is exactly what we're talking about today. Yep. yep, exactly. Uh, let me just cover the last two parts of the CARES Act that at least rely, um, relate to, to people in the construction industry. That's the direct payments to workers and families. That's the $1,200 to adults and the $500 to kids. Those started going out as of last week as well. If you filed your tax returns electronically and you included your bank account uh, for, your, for your refunds, you will have it should have received those direct payments already directly to your bank account and then the unemployment benefits um, they've increased those by six hundred dollars a week but the hitch with that is that you have to have made enough to be able to qualify for that additional 600. okay so let's move on to the paycheck protection program as we said it's sold out right 349 billion was claimed in less than two weeks uh, 1.6 million small businesses received this loans, which sounds good until you realize that this is only 6% of America's small businesses. So the average loan size was 240,000, um, which is a pretty good amount. We obviously you've heard people that have gotten loan amounts in the, the millions. The problem was that the community banks gave priority to their existing clients. 
and the big banks targeted segments of their customers, so much so that there's now a lawsuit uh, against Wells, JP Morgan, and other banks over their practices of targeting their existing customers and not broadly distributing those loans. So the problem was, again, that it all got focused on these big banks and the community banks. And the banks that are the most equipped to be able to distribute this never got the funding. This is the way the timeline worked, right? So the CARES Act came out on March 27th. The SBA opened applications on April 3rd. Um, and they started funding on April 10th. But it wasn't until April 12th that they let the first non-bank lender, the first online lender, which was PayPal, on April 12th. And all the money was gone by April 16th. So that was the problem. That's why so many people didn't get a chance. And like Derek experienced, where you went to a large bank, I did the exact same thing. I went to B of A, didn't get a response, ended up going to a local bank in San Diego. That was not my, they were not my bank, but I, I knew someone that was there and he was able to process it for me. So, um, so now we're into Paycheck Protection Program round two, right? So Congress is due to approve these funds. Now, here's the thing. I, I mentioned that, that they're, they're, they're talking about it this week, but there's an estimate now that it's really going to require $850 billion in additional funding to get all the U.S. small businesses through this crisis. So even this second round is not going to be enough to get through. So if you didn't get funded in the second round, in the first round, our recommendation is make sure that you have all the required information on hand and that you're ready to submit it as soon as possible, as soon as that, that money is, is submitted. Um, I'm going to let uh, Paul explain his situation and what he did because he uh, was first originally with Chase and then found it a different approach. So go ahead, Paul. Okay. Well, I'll give you my story. I started off with uh, Chase and I, I, you know, I, I run a lot of money through Chase and they give me this big credit line. I figure, oh, you're the best person to go to because I've already, I've already got some, I got this huge credit card which already alone with them in a sense. So they, they, they know my credit history and all that kind of stuff. It's a no brainer. I fill out the application. They say, thank you, thank you for the application. We will get in touch with you. Nothing, literally nothing for weeks. So finally, I call them and they say, sorry, I, you know, I wait on an hour. I mean, an hour and a half on hold because what's going on. I, I got to them finally, a customer service person because I have a business account and blah, blah, blah. And after an hour and a half, I get this person on the phone and they say, you know what? We have no idea what's going on. We get these phone calls every every minute. We got stacks of them behind us. We have no idea what's going on. We have no idea what's going to happen. We have no information. So don't call again because we can't do anything about it. I go, that was good. So I never heard from them, really. I just, in fact, I still haven't heard from them. So I was getting a little frustrated knowing what do I do now? And one of my clients or our clients um, said that he applied through PayPal. And I got this stuff through PayPal. I didn't take it serious. I went, well, what's PayPal going to do? So I, after he said, hey, I applied on, you know, Monday and I got signed the loan apps on Wednesday. Oh my God, I should try this out. So I went on PayPal and it's actually way simpler than any loan form I've seen. The only thing they really ask for is, you know, your business license, the fact that you, you know, some, your, you know payroll forms like one quarter and a, cop, a copy of your bank statement so they know where to fund it. Fill that out, send it in, said, oh, well. Well, first, I, I first you apply to PayPal, then they send you back this thing about, you know, within the next hour or so that asks you to fill this form out. Fill out the form, send it back in. Well, lo and behold, two days later, three days later, I get the loan document application. I mean, actually, the loan docs to sign to get the loan. I was shocked. So I signed all the loan docs and I sent them in. And then it can actually reach somebody at PayPal. I can't believe it. So I call PayPal and they, they put you to loanbuilder.com, which is the lending agency for PayPal. And they say, you're in line. It's all good. The next round of funding comes through. You'll get your money. We'll deposit directly in a checking account. You don't have to do anything else, which is more progress than I've made with three weeks with Bank America. And PayPal is available to all of us. I mean, I have to run, run a lot of money through there, but I don't think it mattered because the other guy that did it had no money at all, and he still got PayPal to work. So they're in business to do this. They get 5% of all the loans, including the banks, and they like small businesses, so I would suggest you go there. I'm going to give you a couple things. The loan, the uh, phone number for Loan Builder is 1-800-347-5626. That's one 800 
347-5626. So call them like now. And you can go to loanbuilder.com and that will also get you there. Or you can call PayPal. I think that in this round, next round of funding, if you haven't already signed your loan docs, you're probably not going to get funded, my guess. Because we, they have all these, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, we do have a comment from, uh, from Derek. And uh, I, I really like what you're saying, Paul, which is, look, PayPal, Lendio, these guys are here. But um, you decided, Derek, to go through a local bank, Leader Bank. Derek, I've unmuted you. Are you, uh, are you there? If he doesn't have a microphone on his computer, it's not going to work. Oh, you're right. Yeah. You're right. So I'm just going to read what he yeah. said here. So Leader Bank in Arlington, Mass. has been extremely responsive. The loan officer called me back within five hours. By the second day, I was speaking with the lead loan officer, and now I'm in touch with the head of the PPP program at the bank. BOA responded to voicemails weeks later. Chase, private client, mm -hmm. didn't even respond. Wow. Okay, unless unless Derek has actually signed the loan doc, he's not as far ahead as he needs to be. So Derek, yeah. have you actually signed the loan doc? That's the question for Derek. Yeah, and I think what, what we're finding is that these online lenders, whether it's PayPal or Lendio, I have another client that actually applied through Intuit and QuickBooks. The difference is that these online lenders are able to process their applications much more quickly. Uh, Paul, literally, you just did a DocuSign on on the yeah, computer, right? You I, filled out all your right. Documents. I was so I was so paranoid that I got this ding on my phone at three in the morning, right? And I, I want to get in right. line, so I got out of bed at three in the morning and signed all the yeah. loan docs because I wanted yeah. to get in there as quickly as possible. So that's a little paranoid, but I did that. Yeah, and I believe. That they're all they're all stacked up right now. All the all the people have loan docs signed. So I'm going to suggest, to Derek, mm -hmm. you can apply to as many places as you want. When you go through the application, it'll say, "Have you been funded?" It doesn't say, "Have you applied?" And if you haven't been right. funded, like got money from somebody else, you can apply for five places. So I recommend you apply for more than one. I'm I'm glad your little bank's fine, but if you haven't signed loan papers yet, I would go to PayPal and see if you get them to work at it too. My belief is that everybody's lined up, literally billions and billions of people are sitting there in line with the loan docs already signed. And the minute the money goes through to Bing, they're gonna hit a, you know, accept button, and they're gonna be doing like, you know, 500 loans a minute, because all these right. have already been assigned and approved. And that money's what's gonna that, go, it could go in two or three days. What's that loan number again? I'm gonna go ahead and write it in the chat box so people can, uh, can have access to that. It's, it's 1-800, Three four seven five six two six. Yeah. So unless what's, you what's, have, the, what's the title of the, the what the what's the group? It's loanbuilder.com. It is Great. PayPal's loaning division. Okay. Great. So I, I would apply for that and, and apply for as many places as you can because I believe unless you've got documents signed, you may not get the next you know level of funding because I like PayPal and other places are lining and lining up hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of loans ready to go. The minute the funding happens, they're going to hit a send button and the money's going to be gone really quick. So but if you have yeah. to go to your bank and then they have to get approved and they have to get the loan documents, you have to sign loan documents, you got the loan documents back, that time you might kill you. So I would apply for as many places as you can. It's totally legal. You can, I was afraid to, but I found out I can apply for 10 as long as I haven't been funded yet. So I would suggest that unless you sign loan documents, that you go out and you go to PayPal and you do the process of five your documents to sign in a couple of days, and you get in line with signed documents because I think that's what's going to work. Yeah, that's great advice. Hedge your, hedge your bets and hedge your bets and apply for more than one place. So let me cover now one other topic, which is what Paul's wife asked him as soon as he signed his documents, which is, this sounds too good to be true, right? Are you sure that this loan is going to be forgiven? So this is an actual excerpt from my loan docs that I signed. And um, you want to make sure that your loan docs have this loan forgiveness provision in it. Um, and um, 
this is what was in mine. Paul's uh, loan documents look a little different than mine. I reviewed his yesterday, but his have a, a similar loan forgiveness clause. So you just want to make sure that it has this loan forgiveness clause. And if it does, then yes, it's not only what they're representing, but it's in writing that the loans will be forgiven, provided that, of course, you follow the rules, right? Which is that you spend 75% of the loan funds over the next eight weeks on your payroll costs, and uh, the remaining 25% can be spent on any mortgage obligation, a lease payment, a rent obligation, or utility payments. Uh, what I've underlined there in red, I don't know if you can see that, but I just wanted to point out that the SBA form that my lender used was an 18-year-old form from 2002. And we spoke with another one of our clients in uh, North Carolina or, uh, yesterday, who, or I'm sorry, in Virginia, who uh, had the same, those same outdated loan documents. So they're, they're definitely right. using some and, old documents. And it's an idea. They made more loans in, what, three days than they did in the last 14 years? Some insane number like right. that, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. So the this, this system is way overloaded. And they're using whatever they can to get it through. And again, this is not based on any kind of need. Zero need. We have some people that got funded that had literally all the cash they ever needed. Business was going fine. They weren't even slowing down. And they got funded. So the funding depends on do you get in with the right person? And do you get them docking? And do you get you know in line at the right place, the right stuff and get funded? It has nothing to do with need. Nothing to do if you deserve right. it or not. Forget all that. It's just if you're in place right. at the right time and you get in there, you get funded. Right. And some of our clients have said, oh, well, I feel guilty about taking it. You know, I don't really need it. And our response is, you don't know what to have. You know what? You're, you, you're a small business in an uncertain economy. If you have the opportunity to take this, you should. Um, you've probably heard the press from some of these large companies like Shake Shack, who got $20 million, and Harvard University and all these large companies. You know, that's a different matter. Those are public companies that have other private equity and public equity sources. They have other ways to raise money and get money. You don't. So I, I don't see any problem with applying for these loans and, and, and taking advantage of this program, even if you seem to be fine financially right now, because none of us know how long this is going to, to be yeah. in effect. So, Ed, I have a question for you, since you're probably the, you know, the smart guy here. Um, my understanding is the company, like PayPal, is actually loaning me the money, right? They're doing this like a regular Correct. loan, regular documents, they fill it out, and they're loaning me the money. And what the document says is at the end of eight or 10 weeks, I'm going to have to request to the SBA, is my guess, for them to send the bank the money to, for, to pay off the debt, right? My I don't think it's going to happen that, automatically. Yeah. No, that the, there does need to be a request, but my, my understanding is that request is actually made to the bank, not to the SBA. So okay. um, I, mine, mine didn't say anything about this. I've seen some other loan documents where they say they actually have a loan forgiveness form that you would fill out. So that's what I'm guessing is going to happen. They'll have some kind of a loan forgiveness form. You'll fill out, you know, yes, I certify that I use the money in this way. Maybe you have to include some kind of a backup. And then, um, and then they'll they'll forget the loan. Yeah, we uh, we got a nice you. connection. Derek is saying, "I'll apply at PayPal after this call." This is amazing advice. Thank you. Very and nice. yes, the uh, the audio on my computer is not working. So yes. okay, okay, Thanks, good. Derek. If it, if this webinar gets one person fifty thousand bucks, it was worth the hour. Absolutely right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so so I, another thing is my understanding again is. The, the bank, like PayPal, is actually loaning me the money. It's not the feds that are loaning me the money. It's the bank that's loaning you the money, right? And right. all the right. feds are doing are having the reserves to pay it off when this happens. So the, the crazy part is the feds aren't actually spending any money, right? They're just mm. holding the money right. in reserve so they can pay it off when they have to. But whatever that billion dollars is, it didn't flow from the federal, re from the, you know, the government into your checking account. And went from the bank into your checking account. They reserve that money to pay off the loan, but I don't think they actually funded it, right? Mm. I, I don't think, think they the do money, either. Yeah. It's it's a guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, so that three hundred eighty billion dollars is still sitting somewhere in some government checking account, right? Yeah. Waiting to be used when it needs to be. Earning interest. Yeah, it could be. 
could be. I, I wonder whether the banks have enough capital to be able to fund that if they those banks had that three hundred and fifty billion. I don't know. Um, so Great that's question. interesting. That's a good good question. Let me before we one last thing I just wanted to cover before we leave the loans is there is one other program that is still in development and is geared kind of towards more of like mid-sized companies. This is the Main Street Lending Program. Um, and it's a low interest loan, somewhere between two and a half to four percent. Um, but the, the hitch with this is that the smallest loan amount is one million dollars. So you have to be kind of more of that mid-market size before you can you can take advantage of that. And the loan is not forgiven, so it's a low interest. But for those of you out there that might be looking for other alternatives, that is one other one other uh, program. And it's, it's still it's in development. I we haven't gotten any more information on that yet. Right. So. And even even the other part of the whatever that loan is, that they if you get a loan, we have a client who's applying for a half million dollar loan in a new program. The good news is the interest is really low. It's not forgiven, but it's it's a 30 year amortization. And the first year, you don't have to pay any interest or anything. And it's three and a half percent, right, Ed? Something like that? Yes, right. Right. Three and then a half, now you yeah. can, it doesn't have to be a minimum of a million. You can apply for something else. So this, this rewards the people that know how to apply. Unfortunately, that's yep. what the system's based on, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, let's move on now. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about how this pandemic is facilitating the digital transformation in the residential construction industry. We've talked about this in the previous webinars, but I just kind of want to try to try to tie it all together here in a, a, a neat little bow if we can. Uh, last week, Paul shared with you the what we're calling the pandemic parable of who moved my cheese, right? And how that really is a, a very appropriate parable for what we're experiencing here in this pandemic. And one of the slides that Paul talked about was this this one of the bits of wisdom, which is that if you do not change, you can become extinct. And this is no more true than in a construction company's adaptation of digital technology. So digital tools that every builder should have in their in their toolkit are these which we we've, we've identified and, and have talked about before. Again, the cloud-based construction project management system several different options out there, but that's an absolute must. It was our top recommendation before all of this pandemic stuff hit, but since then it is an absolute necessity. If your company doesn't have a construction project management system, I recommend you do that as soon as possible. Second is the adaptation I, of video look, conferencing yeah. and messaging, yes. Right, I think if, if, if you would go to your client right now and say, well, we don't use cell phones because we think they cause brain cancer or whatever, right? Um, I'm not sure you could get a job, right? And right. I believe that this is like a cell phone. It's just like a tool, it's like a you know a nail gun. I mean, you need it, right? Yeah, it's where it's, it's going. Required. This, is, this yeah. is where the industry is going. Period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then again, lots of resources out there for video conferencing, messaging, screen share. Um, I'm sure every one of you out there is familiar with Zoom, as is all of your kids that are stuck at home, probably using Zoom or go to meetings for all of their remote um, classes. Some people are using Ring Central, um, but there's also some other great tools out there. Loom is a way that you can record video messages and actually transmit them via an email. And Glide is the is the text message equivalent. So instead of sending a text message, you can actually record a live video message on your phone and send it uh, in the same way that you would send a text message. And then the third category of tools is the remote viewing and design tools. And those are things like a 360 camera, Matterport, which we've, uh, which we've talked a little bit about before, I'm gonna share with you a little bit more, and also 3D models and walkthroughs. So this is a, uh, I wanna share with you an email that uh, one of our clients sent out that we really feel is just the perfect case of how you can use this adaptation and embracing new technology to market and distinguish yourself from your competition during this time. So this was from, again, from, from Lewis Builders, and they basically were just saying, look, we have technology. This whole uh, social distancing and, and shelter in place has not slowed us down at all. We haven't, haven't missed a beat. So they use the Matterport program, which is the, the, the virtual uh, 360 camera um, system 
which they use for inspections. Um, they're using um, their Zoom programs for virtual meetings, both on a regular basis with their staff, as well as uh, on an as, as needed basis with their clients. And they're also, they're also offering uh, 3D rendering and remote uh, design programs with their clients. Yes, Paul. Ed, do you have the ability to go like into a Matterport photo with a framing and show it on your computer? Is that not technically possible? Uh, well, let me start with this. So this is um, this is the uh, Matterport uh, system that's used. And um, let me see if I can um, do a do a demo. You know what? Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can can do a frame, demo. The framing here. one's cooler, but you know, the framing would be cool if you can do it. Well, let's just do, as he's setting this up, let's do color commentary, Paul. So basically, yeah, okay. imagine imagine sitting at your desk, wherever you're sitting, you know, in Boston, and suddenly you see a home for sale that interests you in, as you see, Presti's Villa in Mauritius. And you're going, oh, that's nice. Then imagine being able to go in virtually into the house, walk down the hall, go to the right into the kitchen, go to the left, out to the pool, walk around the pool, go back inside, go upstairs, go into the master bedroom, go into the master bath. This is this what the software is doing. And you can allow people go at up, distance, take a tour. You can also go in and watch the television, literally. Go in and click on the television and you can watch a program on the television that shows you how cool the place is. So and you know, this, this 10 years ago would be impossible with Fortune. And now it costs about 3,500, $3,600 bucks for the camera and about 65 bucks a month for up to 25 uses. I think it's mandatory. I mean, it, it'll definitely separate you from everyone else. People can go around and look around and do stuff. The cool thing about this is it takes no expertise. One of the problems we have with co-constructs and builder trend and all that kind of stuff is people actually have to learn something. And it's sort of like you're digging a hole with a shovel. I show up with a backhoe and I go, hey, you should use the backhoe. And they go, I haven't got time to go to backhoe school. Are you kidding me? Well, let me keep digging with the shovel, right? So even though the backhoe is incredibly more efficient, people aren't going to take the time to learn the technology to use a backhoe, which is going to be way cheaper than digging by hand. The good news about this technology is anybody can do it. You just click on it and go. So Ed, you want to talk about this now? All right, so you guys are seeing this this screen, correct? Yeah. Yes. Framing. So how right? So how I'm manipulating this is with my mouse, and it's allowing me to be able to move to any place. Like if I want to move closer to that ladder, I just set my 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 mouse here and click, and it moves me closer to the to the ladder. Each of the circles that you can see on the floor, that's where the camera was set. So each one of those gives you. Um, a, a place where the camera was set. Also, you are you can go in and you can zoom up or back on on various things so that you can actually get close enough. I don't know if I can do this here, but you can get close enough and actually be able to see the writing on the plywood or notes that you were seeing. So this is how a building inspector can, with great confidence, feel like they can actually go in and inspect all of the framing elements be able to see their rough in plumbing, electrical, fire sprinklers, supports. You can see that it really gives you all of the details as if you're virtually standing in this space. So, and again, this was used for uh, inspection purposes, but you can imagine how you could use this same technology with your clients and be able to have them walk through the spaces. So right now right. where you can't go in and have client meetings, you can actually use this and be able to walk in and, and, and walk into the spaces. So for example, let's Either say you're trying working. to get it right to get a job away from another con you, you you and another contractor bidding about a job and let's say it's in Denver and the client lives in New York. Now you're both competing, you're both similar price wise. Now what happens is the guy in Denver, the, your competition shows a couple of pictures and of, of his website and say, I'm really cool and you know, look at the stuff I've done. And you actually take the client and walk them through a job on framing and saying, we will walk you through your job every week. So it's just like you're here. Now, who's the client going to go with? 
I mean, this is way enough, enough technology to be the marketing edge you need to get jobs. So to me, the 3,500 bucks is like a no brainer because how many jobs do you have to get to pay for that? But like anything else, you know, as consultants, you have no problem, you know, getting a contractor to buy a new tractor, no problem. To try to get it by software or a camera, it's a real challenge. All right, so hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea of, of the power of, of the Matterport. Uh, now this is really the, the, the best uh, and, and the most effective way. A, a less expensive way is to, um, to do that here with a 360 camera. So 360 cameras are, are you know, a couple hundred bucks and you basically, they do what, what one picture of a Matterport would do, which allows you to take with one picture, you can capture an entire room or entire space. And then with the, if your client has the, the VR viewers, um, like you see there on the right hand side, they can actually view, um, view the space as well. So, all right. And what, what happens with Matterport, one quick, what Matterport does is the magic technology is, you take all these 360 cameras, the actual, you go out, you set the camera and you hit a button, it goes click, 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 it takes a room, and you step in a bunch of places. The magic of Matterport, and I don't have any idea if they do it, they stitch all those pictures together seamlessly. It's pretty much when you, if you have your iPhone doing a pano and you're taking a picture like that, and it's like, you know, it's actually about 80 different pictures, and you get one picture out of it because the magic software in an iPhone puts the pano together. It's like that. It's some magic software that allows you to walk through the house and stitches everything together. The software is about 65 bucks a month. But once you're on it, you don't, nobody has to have any kind of special downloading or technology or software or an application or anything. They just click on it and it works. All right. With that, Paul, I'm going to let you continue and talk about our, uh, the economic advantage of recruiting and outplacement during the current pandemic crisis. Okay. So, Ed, you're frozen. I don't know why that is, but it may not make a big difference anyway. So, okay. So, the advantage, the economic recruitment outplacement during current pandemic, pandemic crisis. Um, we happen to have a recruiting company. We recruit about 25 companies around the country. They're all construction companies between, you know, two employees and 200 employees. And what we found out is, you know, in, we, until a month ago, it was really an employee's market. I mean, we would put, we had a good track record, but we'd really have to look for people. It was hard. And, but we'd find we had a 9% hit rate, but there was a huge challenge in getting the applicant pool and the pipeline filled up. Well, things have changed radically in three or four weeks. The pipelines have tripled. Everybody's out of work a lot of other places. And there's a general tendency for people in other things like, you know, uh, airlines or in hospitality, whatever, you're looking for new jobs. So it's really done, it's, it's an awesome time to recruit. The, the pickings have never been better, okay? Next slide. There you go. And now we're gonna go through an assessment test here. And the assessment test, you basically, it, you can use this for current employee, current employee evaluations, prospective employee assessment, and outplacement. Outplacement is finding the person's job to leave so you don't feel bad when you let them go. And they also don't give any flack or do wrong determination to suit or something. So these, those are the three things you need assessment test for. I'm going to go through this assessment test really quickly. Um, the first is people handling abilities. Now, what's amazing is if you take this test, we can know more about you in 45 minutes than your mom. And it's, it's, it's amazing technology. So this shows your people handling abilities. And you can see those, your strengths. It, it, so the bar is just quickly is the blue bar is the candidate, the green bar is acceptable, and the gray bar is not acceptable. So if you have a non-acceptable amount, then you don't, that, that's a bad thing. But obviously this person is doing well on everything. So you can see it covers, you know, can you coach, whatever. You have logic abilities, and that goes into discernment, drawing conclusions, and usual logic. And again, we can tell how you are at all these kinds of things. Um, Moving along, we can also tell, next slide, um, your key ability, your overall ability, how you're gonna do your people skills, your logic skills. And we have, you know, you can test for all this stuff. I'm sure there's other tests out there. And, and I would suggest if you're gonna do any recruiting, whether you use us or somebody else, make sure 
you get a good valid test that tells you way more. Because the problem in the construction industry is that the old way of hiring people is you put an ad in Craigslist or you put an ad in, you know, Indeed, see who shows up and you do one interview and take chances. You can eliminate all that guesswork by a little testing. Next slide. So this is an integrity and attitude. This sort of do you lie, cheat, or steal? Um, you, you, the low, in this case, the lower number is good. The red line is bad. So how critical are you? How negative are you? Do you blame others or accept responsibility for yourself? Are you honest? Are you supportive? And if you're under on all these, this is a wonderful person because they don't lie, they don't cheat, they don't steal, they're very positive. If these numbers are high, like on the blame or on dishonesty, probably not somebody you want to hire because they, they tend to lie and over-exaggerate and uh, blame people, other, other people for their problems. Next slide. Emotional competency, we've got are you focused, motivated, um, it's your concentration, your analytic intelligence. Again, we, if you ever want to, we'll do this for you for free. We'll give you the test and we'll I'll go over it. Because unless you've actually had this done to yourself, like with the Grand Canyon, you don't really understand how well it works. But once you've had this done, and somebody who never saw you before in his life can tell you more about you than you possibly could imagine, you have faith in the test or assessment. Next slide. This is sort of like the Briggs Myers. You've got your, your four quadrants, your analyzing logic, controller assertive, supportive and expressive. Analyzer is if you, know, you like analyze stuff. This is, I'm sure Ed, you come out high on this one. Controller assertive, I come out high on that one. It's like tell people what to do. Supportive means you empathize with other people and you really care. And expressive means you're great at a party. So, you know, all those are different traits, but they're used in different ways depending whether you're selling or you're doing. I mean, obviously, you don't want your salesperson to have the same personality traits as your bookkeeper, right? You got to get a combination of all those to work well. Um, and this just goes to the top quadrant, quadrants and how they're analyzed. Next slide. This is the bottom quadrants and how they're analyzed. And this, you know, I hopefully you're getting an idea here, you go in incredible depth. And then the overall recommendation, this is where we used to go in recruiting because we got a lot of applications, especially now. If you're below the red line, uh, we're not gonna do anything. We're just gonna do the automatic, we're not interested notice. Between the, the 30 to 40, I mean 30 to 35, we might consider it, but you're probably not that great. If you're over uh, 45, we'll consider it. If you're over 50, you're awesome. So People that score high on this, we immediately call them and give them an interview. People that are low, we just send them a rejection letter. Next. So if you talk to with outplacement services, there's, you've probably seen a lot of ads on the internet for outplacement these days. What outplacement is, is when you, when you let someone go. I mean, we've had, I've had this problem for a lot of times with clients. Is, you know, the worst employee is one who's not bad enough to fire or good enough to keep, and they stay on forever, right? So, because people feel bad about letting them go. Now, there's a fine line between codependence and being a nice guy, and a lot of people confuse the two. They go, well, I don't want to be really a really nice guy, and the truth is you're being codependent. You need to let them deal with the guy. If they're not any good, they need to know it, move on to something they can be good at. This helps them find that. So, this is what we do in outplacement services. A lot of people do the same thing. You develop a strategy for your career. You, you know, create marketing materials. You grow the personal brand. You're basically helping somebody find out who they are and what they're good at and get a new job. You integrate the networking strategy, you enhance your search. We use all these kinds of things like, you know, uh, uh, Facebook and um, LinkedIn, whatever to help get your job. We negotiate and value job offers. So this, what outplacement does is when you feel bad about letting somebody go, you do this with them. It's not that expensive. Make sure them getting another job they maybe like better than the one when they left you. And what it'll do is it'll avoid them trashing you on the internet. It'll avoid them wrongful termination suits. A lot of times when you let go of employees, there's some negative consequences you do not want to deal with. So that's why outplacement services are valuable if you want to let people go. Next slide. So this is again, for the first week, you assess, identify the personnel. Second week, you review the assessment. Third week, you do job searching. Fourth week, and we and other health placement services will work with somebody until we find them another job. So if you hire out placement services, you're pretty much sure that your employee who's leaving is going to find a job that hopefully better suits them than the one they've got with you. Next slide. All right. Well, 
thank you for that, Paul. Um, I just wanted to add too. I was listening to uh, to a podcast recently, and they uh, it was a construction podcast, um, and uh, they had a labor specialist on, and they were explaining that what's happening now is that there is this migration that's happening from people, very talented people that are in affected industries, like what Paul was saying, hospitality and travel and leisure, and realizing that those industries are gonna be impacted for years to come. So if any of those people were thinking about doing a career change, they're moving into another industries. And the residential construction industry is seen as a good, safe, long-term industry to get into, because obviously people are still gonna be living in homes. Let's face it, we're spending a lot more time in our homes now than we ever have in the past. So it's seen as a growth industry. So we're seeing this very, this influx of very talented people that were in other industries that are now wanting to get into the residential construction industry. So it really is a great time to be, to be recruiting right now. So, all right, I just wanted to bring up this slide, which is um, how we end all of our webinars, but it continues to be relevant every week. And so just kind of real, real quickly to go through our recommendations. The first is to stay informed, right? Things are changing daily. We really are trying to figure out where we are all going. And every week, it seems like there's, there's, there's new things. Um, next week on the webinar, we're going to be talking about, really, we're starting to get an idea of, of where this is going to go, how this is going to impact us as a society, and more importantly, how this is going to in, impact us in the residential construction industry. So. Next week, we're going to present what we feel is our best practices Future. for the post-pandemic um, best practices for the residential construction industry. Um, secondly, remember to connect with your peers. You know, obviously, you haven't gone out to a business lunch or dinner for probably quite a while, and you may not be getting together in person with your, your various marketing or network groups, but it's really important that you continue to connect with your peers. Connect with your peers, either in your Builder 20 groups or your, your uh, Remodelers Advantage groups, something like that. Um, if you have a business coach, connect with them. And really be, um, be, con continue to reach out because um, it's very easy for us to, to start to get more insulated when we're, we're stuck having to work from home or, or not being able to have our normal social interactions. Um, next is to be optimistic about the long term. You know, no one knows exactly what's going to happen in the long term. One of my favorite quotes by Wayne Dyer is, is he says, no one knows enough to be a pessimist. And uh, I think we have to apply that here as well. Um, we have to be optimistic about the long term, but focus on those short-term solutions. A couple of webinars ago, David talked about going in and really focusing on what can I do this week? What can I do this, this today and, and this week? Because that's really all that you can control. Um, and then next is to be selective as to who you share your concerns with. Again, we've talked about this in the past. For those of you that are, are, are owners or presidents of companies that are listening to this, it's important for, you, for your employees to see you as a leader. You need to be confident. You need to be assured. You need to be guiding your company through this very uncertain time. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have your own set of concerns and anxieties and worries and fears. You do. But be careful as to who you share, share that with, right? You want to share that with maybe some of your other senior management as you're trying to deal with some of your challenges. If your wife is in your business, you can share it, share it with them, with your spouse. Um, if your spouse is not in the business, I would not recommend sharing some of those concerns because they've got their own worries and concerns that they're dealing with. And then lastly, realize that this too shall pass, right? This is not a, a, a permanent condition. We're going to get through this. It's definitely going to have some long-term and probably some permanent effects, but we're not going to be living stuck in our houses for the rest of our lives. And we will all get through this together. Um, just want to remind people again that we will be doing this same. Uh, we also do a free weekly group coaching session on Wednesdays. So while in these webinars, we really try to give as much information as we can during our free weekly group coaching sessions, we give you the opportunity to be able to speak up, ask your questions. Um, it's really a great peer-to-peer -peer support group, just like I was saying before. It's an opportunity for you to connect with your peers. And we do that every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, 12 noon Eastern. 
and you can sign up for that on our, our website at uh, www.rcsg.org. Um, any questions that you have, please feel free to, to contact us. Again, here is our, our phone numbers and our email addresses. Myself and Paul and David, we are all available and uh, ready and willing to help anyone in the construction industry uh, get through this, this challenging time. So please don't, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out to any of us. And um, with that, David, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and, and let you close us out. Thank you. And again, everybody's time for joining us, reviewing this. Um, this is good stuff. And the reality is in real time, what Paul just said, if we've generated a $50,000, you know, almost free loan for you, terrific, time well spent. Nicole, is there anything you'd like to say? I'm going to put you on the spot here. <laughs> I can't unmute her. At any rate, we're going to be back again next Thursday, three o'clock. And again, if you want to contact one of us before that, please feel free. We'll be back with some more information next week. And again, thank you for just being part of this and joining us on Thursday afternoon. So until next week, we'll do it again. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your, your joining us and participating. Thank you.